The star of the show is this book, Maze of the Blue Medusa. Let me show you first off um, this gorgeous piece of art, which is the basis of the maze. This is the maze itself depicted, and on the inside front cover is a diagram of the maze with numbered rooms and a key as to what they are, and we'll look briefly at this. I'm not going to show you too much of it before I use it in-game. And of course, let me show you the credits for this publication. It is a beautiful physical product that comes in four color throughout, glossy paper, very tight binding, uh, just beautifully produced. The table of contents here will explain to you what's going on within the system of, or the game system conventions that are used to represent all this material, and it is broken down into the major segments of the maze. The maze itself, I'm going to skip over this for a moment, here's a chronology of the maze and there is an, a history starting back, uh, way back when, at the beginning of the cosmos, with what is depicted in the maze. And the maze is sort of a living chronology of this world and some general guidelines on how to use the material. And then um, there is an opening section on encounters that will be your random encounter table. And if you look at the back of the book, you have a table to roll on for random encounters, some of which will be changing depending on which segment of the maze you are in. And, a, and also alongside that, a table for searching the body of a random encounter. This is a D100 table. One of the things that makes the book so friendly for the solo GM, and as I randomly open it up here, you can see uh, this section on the verso is depicting this part of the painting and of the maze. And then on the recto here, it is showing you numerically a general description of what it is. And if you see an arrow, you can turn the page and get in more description, including whether there are encounters to be had. And then within the general section, if uh, there are specific tables like searching the body, for example, or a random encounter that comes in here, there are other table, other D100 tables to roll on. So you can see immediately how for the soloist this is going to be fantastic because it is self-contained and every section has a new random table for you. So if you are going into, for example, here the Almery, you're going to be having a thematically generated set of what you find on the body or what a random encounter is. The work is already done for you. It's already thematically put together. And ditto this map here. You can make your own decisions about how you travel through it based on what you want to do, and I'll talk about that and demonstrate it when I play. Or you could simply decide, for example, as I originally thought I might do, this is the gardens area here in green. Maybe my adventure is going to be just within one particular section of the map. Ultimately, I decided not to do that. But because you have the structure here that's so intricate, and I haven't actually looked to see how many different rooms there are, but I'll put that number up here. It's so rich. This is something you can go back to again and again and again. And in fact, at the back of the book, although I'm not sure who would want to write in this lovely book, there are pages of notes for you with different uh, line paper. Obviously, they had some pages to fill, which is understandable. You've got blank graph paper and then just blank paper entirely. If you wanted to, you could simply keep track of all the rooms that you went in in one adventure and make sure that you played through different rooms, um, you would have this for many, many, many sessions. So not only is it a lovely physical product, but for the soloist, it really is in one volume providing just hours of opportunity and hours of game. And so this is going to be the backbone of the story that I'm creating right now. Before I move away completely from discussion just of this book, I want to point out um, something here at the beginning to explain the concept of this book as it was written um, by the creators. This is from the the artist. I made a painting and then Patrick wrote room descriptions for each part of the painting. Then we passed it back and forth for years, writing and rewriting, trying to make it into the kind of dungeon we wish we found all those times we cracked open a new module only to be disappointed. 
something strange and interconnected and bringing enough ideas to the table to be worth what you paid. And um, then there's a little bit more there. The art and the visuals of this book, which is hard for me to convey to you in this video, and indeed, in a way, I think is challenging even to convey in the book. And over here, I'll put this link up uh, under my video. This is a link to this painting that you can see and see larger to get all the intricate details of it, is, is really very significant and a living part of working with this material and I think using this material because I just want to open up to one page and try to show you a little bit more closely the evocative nature of the art. Each section is quite different actually and the the visual experience, I think, of looking at this in a book becomes part of your story. And again, this is another way, at least for me, that this material works so well for me as a solo player because it's like you get the benefit of you're reading a book, you're looking at a piece of art, you're envisioning the art, and this, um, the words and the imagery work so well together to put you in a place. And I'm going to try to convey that with what I'm showing here, but honestly, it's a little bit difficult to do, I think, in video format and not actually seeing, um, seeing this unfold before you. And um, it's just... Um, it's just magnificently done and the way the painting is a maze and highlighted throughout, it puts you situationally into the room, into the context, and it also puts you there aesthetically by looking at the individual um, aspects of the piece. So again, it's, it's a little challenging to convey it, I think, um, in words and even in visual showing you without you actually having the physical object in your hand. But to me, this created an additional um, aesthetic experience, I guess is the only way for me to say it, that I haven't really had in um, using other types of material. And now to go from something gorgeous to something pretty functional. Uh, I have one of my viewers to thank really for the origins of my thoughts on doing something with a ranger character. And that's how this whole video started. Um, somebody put a comment up on one of my videos. I don't actually remember who or which video. Mentioning this article that I tracked down, and I'll put up the, I think it's from Dragon Magazines from 1986. You can't really see that down there. The Ranger Redefined, Systems for Giving the Class More Skills by Deborah Christian. And it is an article that talks about this Ranger character. And at the end of it, it goes through different things that a Ranger might do, scouting, spying, infiltration, disguise. And it gives you some charts, which I will be picking up and using to flesh out some of the survival, survival skills that a Ranger may have. So I was interested in creating a ranger character. The other thing that I had been thinking about was from this, the um, so-called Holmes edition of D&D, and this particular chart here, the explanation of the thief's abilities. And we have basic abilities here, open lock, remove trap, pickpocket, etc., with a percentage chance of success. Very simple to use. I'm going to be running a third level character, or here it's a C. And I gravitate to charts like this, old charts like this, that are simple, when they give me some percentile chance, because it's very easy for me, without a lot of apparatus, to just enact this action and do a D100 roll, and I'm either successful or I'm not. It's pretty simplistic, but I feel that the um, percentages have been worked out by somebody else, you know, decades ago in this case, to make some kind of thematic sense for the character. So I had been wanting to run a thief, uh, and I had been wanting to create a ranger. And then when I realized I wanted to do something with this material here, which is a dungeon crawl, a ranger's not really going to work in there, I decided that 
I'm going to create my story around some type of ranger thief. And the backbone of this character is going to be starting out in somewhere in this maze. And the loose story is that this lone character is going to be wandering through this maze, needing to, using his thievery abilities, um, obtain things, get loot. I don't really know because I'm not sure what's possible here, but that's going to be unfolding. And when this character exits this maze, however I decide that to happen, he's going to exit into an external area where his ranger abilities are now then going to be utilized in primary along with whatever material, experiences, etc. he's gained from here. So it's going to start out as a dungeon crawl and it's going to end up as a hex crawl. And I have some overall concept of how that's going to work in my mind, uh, but again, a lot of it is just going to be unfolding. To continue to flesh out my character, I'm going to be picking up some basic stats from this version of the player's handbook. And most significantly, I am also going to be folding all of this into the rules for Songs of Blades and Heroes. The main reason that I'm doing this is I want to pick up the activation rules and I'm actually going to be tweaking them a little bit, but the activation rules from this set, uh, it's a mini skirmish rule set that's pretty rules light, but it assigns values to everything and you are rolling up to three d6s to see how many actions you get to take and um, whether you have successes or failures based on what is known as your quality stat. And in the way this works skirmish wise, you would with failures potentially allow your opponent an action. In this case, I'm modifying these a little bit, but keeping the same idea and you'll see it in action. But the overview simply here is that you're choosing uh, in this case, either two or three d6s to roll. And based on your successes and failures, failures then allot an extra action to the other side. And what this allows for is a very basic, um, I don't want to call it AI, but a basic activation system that is, is essentially luck-based because it's based on the, um, the d6 roll that I make to have encounters going back and forth. It's likely going to be mostly combat encounters, but it could also potentially be other types of interactions. So I know um, it removes some of the challenges that I think the soloist has, which is like, well, when do I go and when do they go? And using this overall structure, this will uh, basically model that for me and direct that for me. So rather than uh, explaining it more, I'll just show it to you in action but I did want to give you an overview of the structures that I'm using. Additionally, uh, I'm going to be using a few additional sort of dungeon crawl tropes for um, the rooms that I go into to determine the light source, to determine what type of potential content is in the room, and therefore what type of combat is going to be available and some of this is going to be coming from this rule set and additionally some of it is going to be coming from what's available here. So it's let's take a closer look at the songs of Song of Blades and Hero rules because this is going to be the foundation of my character. Again these are skirmish rules and they are going to have information that I'm not using because they are designed primarily to build a warband and fight it against another warband. And this point value here refers to uh, part of the aggregate number of points that you are allowed to use to build your warband. So we're not going to be dealing with that. But the quality number here and the combat number here are what we are going to be using as well as some special moves. So 
quality. It says, this is an overall indication of the model's willingness to fight, reaction speed, initiative, and morale. It is the minimum number to be rolled on a die to activate the model, and this is a D6 system. So the lower the number, the better. This means that quality 2 plus is better than quality 3 plus, etc. So when it is your turn, as per these rules, you would nominate one of your models to act, and then you would roll um, up to 3d6, and it says every roll that is equal or better to your quality is a success, and every roll that is lower is a failure. And as I said earlier, this is going to form the, found, the backbone of how I interact with the environment and with the encounters and with the NPCs that I meet up with. The other role uh, number here is the combat number, and this number is going to be added to a role. And um, in my case, I'm going to use a d20 because I'm mapping it onto basic D&D, and this is essentially going to be the uh, serve as the modifier. Whatever modifier I need, it's going to be coming from this combat role. So if I was doing something that required, you know, melee combat required a strength modifier, this would count as that. If I was doing ranged combat and I needed that modifier, this would count as that. Now for the case of my elf ranger here, I'm picking up the basic um, stats here for a combination, basically. I'm starting out uh, with the stats from this elf young warrior because in this maze, I cannot use any of my ranged abilities. This means my combat is going to be at uh, a 2. Once I get outside and I'm in my natural environment, my combat value is going to rise to 3. So uh, initially, these are going to be what I'm following here. I'm going to have a quality of 3 plus and a combat of 2. And then when I move outside, I'm going to have my combat value of 3. And my quality is going to be at 2. And again, the lower number here is better for activation. And then I will pick up the special rule of the long shooter. So that's going to form uh, the foundation of most of the encounters, we're not going with any other sort of stats like dexterity, wisdom, whatever. However, we are picking up um, from D&D, we're picking up a few things. And what we are, here is the notes I've made. Uh, my elf ranger, his name is Adorn, A-D-O-R-N-E, I don't know why. Adorn the elf ranger, and he has, based on D&D, um, He's got uh, primeval awareness. He does have a beast companion, but I've got this in parentheses here because in my story, he has lost his companion. They'll be reunited, I guess, after he makes his way through this maze. But right now, he is alone. He has three, as a level three character, he's got um, three level one spells, animal friendship, a cure wound spell, and the hail of thorns. This Hail of Thorns is a range of five feet, so he will be able to use this in the maze where he can um, require, you know, throw some thorns at an enemy and um, they would have to do a saving throw in order to minimize the damage there. And when it comes up, I'll show you how that works. He's not going to be able to use his animal friendship in the maze. He also has Mask of the Wild. Again, not going to work here in the maze. This is an external um, attribute that has to do with hiding in the environment. And when he gets outside, he'll be able to use that. He is going to pick up per um, the, the rules here. He's going to be picking up some gold. And I'm going to come in now and just sort of show you how I do this. So you can see that um, I'm uh, just doing it per the rules, and let's find this page. So he's going to get his starting wealth by class as a ranger. It's going to be 5d4 times 10 gold pieces. So we're going to roll my um, 5d4s here, sorry about the lighting, and see what we get, and then I'll show you what I spend it on. All right, I reoriented a little bit to have the space to roll, and here are my five uh, d4s and we'll see what we got two three four five six seven eight nine ten all right we got a hundred gold pieces to uh spend which is not great 
So we'll note that down here and take a look at our equipment options. And whoops, let's see, hang on. All right, looking at our equipment options, we are not gonna be in great shape. Um, I'm gonna take a, we're gonna take a dagger. And by the way, so the rules, the skirmish rules are very general and don't have any indication of individual equipment or armor or anything like that. And I'm picking up this, I'm picking up weapons and adventuring gear and things like that based on the money that I have for my own uh, development of the character, for my own theming of the character and thought about the character. Whether or not it comes into play or how it comes into play as I go through the maze, we shall see. So based on the 100 gold pieces, I'll be picking up some weapons. I'll show you what I decide later on. I'm going to take a dagger and I'm going to take a light crossbow, which I will not be able to use in the maze, but I'm going to have it nevertheless. And um, it's probably some adventuring gear and things of that nature. So I will take care of that and show you what I've decided. And the final thing I'm going to do is roll on this D100 trinket table to pick up a trinket, because why not? May or may not come into use. Um, but let's see, see what we roll and what we pick up. We rolled an 88. And what is trinket 88? Trinket 88 is a book that tells the story of a legendary hero's rise and fall with the last chapter missing. All right. That's great. We've got a book, and um, this may come into play thematically as we go through the maze. We've spent our money on leather armor, a hand axe, a light crossbow, thievery tools, because we are a thief after all, a healing kit, some acid, which is a ranged weapon, but may work inside the maze, we're not sure. And I added in this signet ring, um, which is sort of unspecified use, but I'm signaling the fact that I am a uh, magic user, I do have some spells, and indeed we are going to consider that we have magic for the purposes of traveling through the maze, because if we encounter something that can only be dealt with by a magical person, that is going to be us. So I use the signet ring to symbolize that. So that's how I've spent my money. And I'm going to use this book as a way into this story. We're looking here at my character sheet. I'll probably clean it up. I added in some basic uh, stats in case I need them, and I think I'm ready to go. I... As the story of the maze goes, about 8,000 years ago, three perfect sisters were born, and due to some events that happened, they disappeared and were said to be carried into the maze of the Medusa. And this is a much shortened version of the history that's given here. And there was a former servant of the Perfect Three, as they were known, who set off to find them. And this was someone named Ashen Chanterelle. And she herself, I'm thinking it's a she, herself was imprisoned into the maze in a painting. And this is where we're going to find ourselves entering into the maze at the place known as the false chanterelle and this is part this is going to be room one and i'm going to say here that um this is part of working with this material that if you follow the narrative that's set out for you it can create the structure that you can work with and i'm not going to in a video, sit here and read this to you, but the first couple of rooms here are giving more information about the story and the painting, and you can see the painting up here and what is happening and a, some suggestion of activity that a GM would give to the players. Now, obviously, on your own, you do or don't have to follow all of that, and of course, using it as the solo player, it is very much involved with the narrative as it is presented, at least for me, and um, it almost becomes a partner to you. But of course, before we go anywhere, we need to roll for a random encounter in the maze. This is a D100 table, and we're rolling an 8. The Lost Lizardman Reptile Woman Mummy is, is out, going to be our encounter, so we 
come back to the beginning of the book and we find this encounter and let us see what it is. There are several reptile mummies who could well have wandered away from their archives, which is the top left of the map, and gotten lost. Now, if you read the history of this world, you will understand the significance of the reptile mummies in the archives, and I'm not going to go into that here, but it is um, it does make sense in the story. Away from the music of the sleeping chimes that fills that space and calms them, they may be frightened, irritable, and angry. Roll a d6 to see which mummy you encounter. All right, we'll do it. Number five. Crotalus Heridus, a mummy stuffed with misspelled index cards. Hmm, Archive 168. This is interesting to me because, of course, we're carrying a book, and I had considered entering the maze at the archive because that seemed thematic to the little trinket that I had, but um, I didn't do that, but then I got this. So I think it's time to go to Archive 168 and just see what that is. So what's interesting to me is um, if we can kill this guy and search his body Maybe we'll get something of use to us. So his stats are going to be with Archive 168, and we can see here that um, he has um, an AC of 17, uh, hit dice of 8. He does a D12 bite and can be harmed only by magical weapons except fire, which does 2 times damage. Well, we don't have that. So we have encountered somebody who potentially has something we need or want or will... Um, illuminate the reasons that we're here and um, we need to deal with this reptile mummy so let's, let's take a look at how we build an encounter the first thing that we're going to do is to determine the the light source in the room and this is a d6 table and we will see we rolled a six so it's going to favor diurnal characters, which would be us, actually. So in this situation, we're going to get a plus one modifier to our combat rolls. The next thing we're going to do is determine whether or not um, there is potential shelter in this room, um, a place for this frightened guy to hide. Again, d6 table, we rolled a five. This is a treasure room. That's great. So uh, there's going to be additional treasure in here. And with, but there will be no um, additional type of um, potential places to hide through the combat. It's not, it's neither cluttered nor scenic. So a cluttered room gives more opportunities for the uh, creature to hide, and a scenic room gives a potential opportunity, but there is nothing additional in this room that hasn't been described. However, it is a treasure room, and as such, we're going to go to the songs, a Song of Blades and Heroes uh, rule set to look and roll on the treasure tables here. This is actually, I, I should correct myself, because this is the Song of Gold and Darkness, the dungeon rules that come, uh, that are a subset of, or a, a, a you know, a development. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so we are in the dungeon rules here, and we're going to first roll on the magical treasure table, a d6 again, and that's a 2. So we're going to be getting some type of potion and rolling on the potions table. And that potions table is right here. It's, a, again, another d6 roll. So we got a 1, a potion of fire breathing. Well, that's... <laughs> it's actually really funny because I think that said 2 times damage for fire. I mean... I gotta say, this, <laughs> I did not set up that roll. That's pretty funny. Um, treat a shooter along with a combat score of five. So basically, um, we get one uh, model can spew flames once. So we're gonna get that potion, and um, I guess we could potentially use it and get do two times damage for this poor guy. So let me make a note of that. And. Well, actually, you know what? I'm, I got to correct myself again, because this, of course, is in the room. We do not have it yet. So this is a treasure that's in the room that we will get um, once or whether or if we kill this, uh, this creature that we've encountered. So this is actually just an additional possibility. We, do not, we did not just pick that up. So got to correct myself on that point. And 
back to what we're doing next. Now, the main thing we need to do is we need to assign values to the creature that we have encountered in the maze from the Song of Blades and Heroes. So this is a reptile woman mummy and we need to find those some mummy stats which um, I know there are mummy stats somewhat well here it is the undead let's see I will find these stats all right well I found the mummy and this uh, these are the basic stats a quality of a five plus and a combat of a three so he's going to be hard to activate with this and special rules undead tough terror slow which we will um, delineate in a moment. The other thing though that I want to do, there's these frog folk, you know again you're mapping something onto something, so um, there are these frog folk and they all have the special amphibious rule which of course I also need to apply here to try to approximate as much as possible what I am encountering. Assigning the enemy the characteristics Undead, Tough, Terror, Slow, and Amphibious from the Song of Blades and Heroes rulebook yields some information about what would happen on a, sh a shooting attack, for example, which we won't do. We would be at a minus two. It indicates that as an undead, they're never going to flee from the fight. And if they roll two fails in a roll, they will crumble to dust. They are a tough target. They're hard to kill. And this means that the uh, gruesome death rule from Song of Blades is not in effect, so we won't even deal with that. They do inspire terror, and what this means is that we cannot enter melee without passing a quality roll to see if we have enough courage for that, and we also have to do morale checks each round of combat. So that adds yet another check level to see if we can continue to engage with them. They are slow. Um, I'm not really dealing with movement so much, so again, that's not going to come into effect and they're also as a reptile mummy they have the amphibious characteristic this means that they wouldn't have a movement penalty if we were dealing with water but again we're inside and that is not in effect in this particular room I determined that the light source is going to favor this mummy and per my solo rules what this means is that it's going to bring its quality number for this engagement down to a four plus, which means it will be that much more likely to be able to engage each round. The um, room content we already talked about with a potential additional treasure there, and I think that's it. And so now we can see the core of how I've chosen this rule set to allow for combat and the flow of combat. The first thing that we do is we just need a basic initiative roll, and that is simply the higher number on 2d6s. Okay, here we go. So for this, um, for this, for this interaction, um, I will be representing myself with these black dice and the reptile mummy with these sort of blue multicolored dice. So the first thing we need to do is to roll for initiative and that would come to us. So we are going to be engaging actively for the first round of combat. What we are going to do is make a choice of rolling two or three d6s for our first round to see what we can do. Now we have a, just to remind you, anything that is a three or plus on a d6 will be an action that we can take. If we fail, that will go to, for the next round, the reptile mummy will have an additional action. We're going to be wielding our hand axe, which delivers slashing damage, a 1d6 of slashing damage, and um, that will work because um, they are not susceptible to piercing damage, but we're not using our crossbow anyway. So we're going to start out by simply rolling two d6s and seeing what we get. So we roll two fours and per our quality number, this is going to give us two successful actions, two successful attacks. To do an attack, we roll a d20 and we add in our combat modifier, which is a two. And for a success on that, we are looking to get a 17 or above. So this is going to be our first roll. We just got it, so that's one successful hit. 
we've uh, slashed or we've hacked through once successfully and one fail. So we are going to be doing 1d6 of damage and that's just one. So we're going to keep track here. Uh, we've got keep track here. We did um, one damage thus far and that is the first round of combat. We didn't need to check per the terror rule for that because we had won the initiative. So in that instance, we were good. Now um, we come to the mummy. So the mummy as baseline is going to be rolling two d6s, but they're going to be getting one of our actions for another one. They need to be rolling a four, five, or six for a success. And so they've got two successes here and one fail. The way my rules work, these fails do not, at the end of a round, go back and forth to me. So they're not cumulative. So they now have two attacks in a row um, against us, and their combat modifier is a three, and our they need to be rolling an 11 or greater to have a blow. So they rolled nine, 10, 11, 12. No, that's a six, sorry. So that's a miss. And I won. Well, we got lucky. So they did two misses, and that's that round of combat. Now, per the terror roll, we need to do a, a check, a morale check. To do that, we are rolling three d6s. I'll take the ones that actually are associated with us. We're rolling three d6s, and um, we, if we fail three times on our quality, so in our case, three or above, we need to roll for a success. If we have three fails, we're going to flee this combat. If we have two fails, we're going to forfeit our next turn, and anything else, we will be um, having enough courage to continue on. So we rolled a five, a two, and a one. So this is actually two fails. So we are so afraid of dealing with this terror, this horrendous reptile mummy that we cannot act this turn, so it's going to keep coming at us. It is going to roll, choose to roll three d6s to do an attack, and it has successfully rolled, it has rolled two successes and one fail. This fail comes over to us for the next round, the next turn. It's two successes, it's going to allow us two attacks. Let's d20 and add its combat bonus of plus three to see if it can get an 11 or greater. That's one success there, and that is two successes. So it's got, um, that was a nine. It's gonna do two hits worth d12 damage each, and that was a seven and a another seven so it's doing 14 bites on us now the question is how do you um, how do you characterize the actual damage that is done i skipped i skipped over this part and shouldn't have actually the other aspect of determining the the characteristics of what you are coming up against here is to figure out the relative damage that is being done. So the bite per the uh, Maze of the Blue Medusa rolls here for this mummy is a d12 bite. However, not every one bite, I would say, from this mummy, for example, would be the same thing as one whatever from a different type of enemy. So I look at that as well when I'm figuring out what the encounter is going to be like and ascertain off of some abstract baseline what the number is going to be. And in this particular case, I had decided that the uh, it was going to be divided in half. So um, again, this is very inconsistent. It is abstract. It's not probably something that would work running in a group, but this is part of the procedure that I go through to figure this stuff out. And it's usually something that's divided in half or not. I mean, basically, uh, you could have maybe a plus modifier to it if there was some massive boss, for example, in the maze. I don't know if there is or not. Um, but in this case, so that is the ultimate damage is going to be seven, and uh, we will take that damage and move on. 
and we decide we want to flee this attack. And when we're fleeing, we are going to be subjected to one potential, uh, it's called the free hack. And so the mummy is going to roll to see, did they have enough to do that? And they did not. We have disengaged from this mummy and we've got seven wounds to, to our, we've got seven wounds to deal with. And that, that's the end of that engagement. So I'm not going to, and that's the end of that engagement. The mummy was pretty, pretty difficult to handle. And this does make sense per both sets of rules, really. Uh, and because of the nature of that fight, I'm not going to be able to do what I want to do, which was to roll on the D100 table and see what we got from the body, for example. But I'll give you a look here. This is the encounter D100 table that's at the back of the book. And as I mentioned earlier, the tables that are within the book are thematic to the rooms and things that you're in when you search those bodies, but that is the one for the uh, generic encounters. And I've, I've moved spots here just to get better light on some of the art because I really, really want to show you how significant it is in working with this material and how it really becomes a big part of the experience. This material is both self-contained and expansive and as such it functions quite well as the backbone for a story and in this particular case I'm going to continue through the maze for a bit with this character trying if I possibly can to get some loot to get some things to take it outside for the next part of this adventure where the character is going to be interacting with some wilderness.